Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the first episode of Thingcast. Uh, this is going to be an attempt on, on my part to make a kind of semi-regular broadcast where I get to talk about stuff uh, that's been happening as far as uh, gadgets go without actually you know, going through the formalized structural review and uh, you can kind of keep up with what I'm doing. So uh, today is... Um, Sorry, I've forgotten the date, actually, but just to date the uh, podcast, today is the 15th of May, and the topics we're going to try and cover in this episode is the Chromebook 11 that I somehow managed to buy, uh, the NAD Viso HP 50, uh, which I do have a review unit of at the moment, uh, the Sennheiser HD DJ headphones, and the Audio-Technica M50X and as always, uh, you can uh, join in on the live Q&A while this broadcast is streaming. So if you've got any questions or comments, just pop them in the Q&A and I'll try and answer them. So the first thing that I think uh, would be good to talk about is this thing, which has come into my life as a sort of magical computer. And now it has a name. Uh, this is the HP Chromebook 11 G2. And honestly, I really wouldn't be so excited about this computer because it is a, you know, cheap kind of, uh, you know, basic no-frills computer. I wouldn't be so excited if I wasn't able to accidentally, like, if, if the story wasn't the fact that I bought this uh, before it was announced. So this computer has proven to be quite interesting because as far as I know, I'm the only one who has a YouTube account and is prepared to make videos about this computer. So that's been really interesting to uh, do. Um, a lot of people ask me why I went with the Chromebook, especially considering that recently my iMac uh, did start, stop working. Uh, let me say first that the iMac is being repaired at the moment. It is in the local Apple store and they are having a look over it. The last news that I heard about my iMac was that um, there was some software failure, actually. It wasn't a hardware failure, that there was some sort of drive partitioning error, which meant that uh, the hard drives, you know, something went dreadfully wrong. And then they kind of, um, the technician on the phone kind of tried to ask me, did you install um, Windows on your computer? Did you install it incorrectly? And somehow, like, you know, trying to put the blame on me. And I'm like, I just installed Windows... Um, and as you know, I use Windows uh, on my iMac. Uh, I just installed Windows using the built-in um, boot camp thing, right, with the, the, the iMac dual boot thing. I didn't do anything special. You can't, you know, pin this on me. But that was his kind of thing. Um, and while the iMac is in there, I'm also trying to get them to fix up some fan noise that I'm experiencing with the computer. I don't know if it's fan noise or just some sort of clicking noise. I'm not really sure. But anyway, that aside, this Chromebook... Uh, is I didn't buy this to replace the iMac. I actually bought this really more or less uh, out of curiosity. I wanted to actually give this thing a go. I wanted to give the whole Chrome OS thing a go. Um, I've always had a philosophy of don't knock it till you tried it. And as far as uh, Chrome OS goes, um, it's, it's surprising how much hostility Chrome OS seems to generate in a lot of people because they say, uh, you know, it doesn't work without the internet connection, therefore it's useless. Well, basically, if... If my computer stops working without the internet, like if I don't have internet on my computer, I basically stop using the computer anyway. Any computer I use. Uh, if, if I can't get on the web, uh, if I can't you know, do something, most of the times I have nothing to do on the computer. So for me, I don't think not having the internet connection on the computer is such a bad thing. Um, especially the fact that you can, you can still tether these to your, your smartphones and everything and get a wireless connection. So... That's all really good. Um, the story goes is that I, I bought this computer and I really shouldn't have been able to buy it because it hasn't been announced yet, but it is a nice piece of hardware. I've made that hands-on video and that kind of thing, so you know I can't really say that much more about it. Uh, one thing that I can say is that Chrome OS is actually a really, really simple to use operating system. And if I had to buy a computer for my mom or someone who wasn't very computer experienced, I would actually really solidly consider the, the, the Chromebook, especially if they weren't looking to go outside, because as long as you don't buy one of these, because these have this awful slow processor, but 
Um, if they were looking to buy a computer that you don't have to update, it automatically updates everything. Everything is stored on the cloud, so you don't have to have backups. Uh, you don't have to worry really about the hardware. If your computer dies, it's as simple as signing in on another Chromebook and you have access to everything. Um, everything updates, as I said before. Uh, and everything's simple. You know, no viruses, no none of that kind of thing. And it basically does what most uh, people who use computers nowadays do. They just hop onto the internet and they, they do a, a, a few things. So, you know, um, definitely there's a lot of power users who I understand who would look at this idea and just go, like, just... What a stupid piece of um, uh, useless hardware! But you know, this wasn't made for power users. This is clearly not intended for like a user like me who I want to be able to edit videos on the go and everything like that. But so far, um, you know, the other this piece of hardware I think is being designed for education markets. So it's not particularly powerful. The screen isn't very good, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, though it is a really nice little design. Uh, if I was going to get a Chromebook for myself or for someone else, I would probably look at the Acer C720 because that has the Intel Celeron chips and uh, it's much more responsive. It has a better screen, etc., etc. Et et it's a lighter. It has better battery life. Well, I looked at the Toshiba, the 13-inch Toshiba, because for that price, for a 13-inch screen, it's actually quite nice. The keyboard's nice and easy to type with. So again, the word with Chromebooks is easy to use. That's that's really what I'm finding with the Chromebook, and you know, I'm I'm kind of having fun with using it. Uh, so yeah, I mean, it's it's really funny that I managed to buy this computer, considering that basically when I bought this computer, um, it, it wasn't like I was like, when I was in the store, I knew that this was an unannounced model. I bought this thinking it was the glossy white HP Chromebook, um, and then they opened it up. I wanted to know what color it was. We opened it up in the store. And then we kind of stood there and we had no idea what this was and then we tried to look it up on the internet and it wasn't there. And if they weren't supposed to sell it to me, um, I actually spoke with several staff members who who we went through the whole story and at no point did anyone say, hang on, maybe we shouldn't sell this to you. So, you know, I, I'm pretty sure this thing will be hitting retail in the next few days. Um, so that's going to be interesting. But I did get a little bit of a scoop, so that's been exciting. I've literally got an... Um, 100% more views uh, in the past day or so uh, than I ordinarily would receive on the channel just because of people watching uh, this video on this computer. So that's been pretty cool. So yeah, um, that's as far as I have to say about the uh, Chrome OS operating system and the Chromebook. Again, if it's easy to use, uh, I, I would recommend it for a uh, you know an inexperienced user. Now I'll just answer a question from EHUD. This is not actually related to the Chromebook, but it is, uh, you know, a, a tech question. Hey, do you have a DSLR? Do you like taking stills? Um, I do have a DSLR. I use a Sony Alpha 6000, and basically, almost every video that you watch uh, at the moment that I'm making, I've actually been shooting on the Alpha 6000. Let me just show you what it is. So, this is my. Ooh, sorry. Try not to move around too quickly. Uh, this is the Alpha 6000. It is a really recent release from Sony. Full disclosure, I did manage to buy this at a discount because I'm part of a Sony social media kind of program that gives me discounts on hardware. Um, I'm not obligated to say anything about Sony, but they do choose people who are more likely to say things about Sony uh, and who are existing fans of the company and who use social media. Um, that aside, this is a fantastic, absolutely fantastic camera. Um, this was the replacement for my NEX6, and basically they improved on every single problem that I had with the uh, NEX6. So um, I do shoot stills, but I tend to take a lot of photos, uh, not particularly portraits. I tend to like taking landscape details, uh, that kind of thing. I do have a Flickr. If you want to see some of my photos, you can. You can go to my Flickr account. If you go to my YouTube channel, and on the banner in the bottom right corner are some social links. One of them is my Flickr account. So if you want to check out my photos, you can. They're all mostly photos of creepy looking buildings and streets because I have this strange fixation on that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, the Alpha 6000 is amazing. The autofocus system, which is the biggest thing on this camera, um, apparently has the world's fastest autofocus. I can't, I can't really say that to be true or not, but I do know that it is very accurate autofocus. I have been using 
the 6,000 in all my videos now because I found that uh, it will autofocus properly on objects as they get close in and out. So uh, you might have seen in recent videos I've been holding up things closer to the lens and it does uh, adjust a lot more whereas uh, the older NEX6 and the older NEX F3, which I would also shoot on, I could not necessarily trust uh, with the autofocus. But yeah, no, um, if you, uh, I think Engadget just put out a review of this this morning. This is a fantastic camera and it is actually cheaper than the previous generations. Uh, I would heartily recommend the Alpha 6000 um, if you wanted to get a DSLR. Anyway, okay, so moving on to the next topic that I wanted to talk about, and that is the NAD VSO HP50. Now, a lot of people have been asking me for a long time uh, for a review unit, uh, for, for me to, to have a listen to this and tell you what I thought, and I got to thank uh, NAD uh, Australia and, you know, NAD, the, the main company itself, for uh, lending me out this review unit. It's been really exciting to actually finally get a listen to this. Um, I was going to do an unboxing of this, but actually it turns out I got a review unit which had already been unboxed, so I didn't really want to do an unboxing of a video, of a box that was already open. Uh, okay, so you're probably interested to hear what I have to say about this headphone. I can tell you uh, the hype is very much real. Um, everything that I've read about this headphone is being very positive, and I have to say this is a really, really nice, finely tuned headphone. It is a bit on the warmer side. It is a very mellow sounding headphone, um, but at the same time, there's a there's a richness to the sound. There's a tightness. Um, the bass, uh, everything is very clean. Um, the only kind of thing that I would comment as a negative in terms of the sound of this headphone is that at times the it, I wish it had a little more high frequency extension and a little more texture because as it is, it sounds just a little bit uh, closed off. It sounds a little bit uh, stuffy just because that that last bit of of the high frequency is a bit missing. So I mean, if you wanted a relaxed sound, this is certainly it. Um, but I think my preferences are just for if this was going to be a perfect sounding headphone. I just wish I had a little bit more detail in the um, upper end. Um, the other things I can comment about this headphone, uh, it, it does come with a portable cable. It basically comes with a short cable that implies that you would use this with iPhones and stuff like that. But honestly, I think that this headphone looks really goofy uh, when you see it. Um, just with this, just both in terms of this headband and also the big uh, Viso logo here and the big NAD logo and the glossy plastic. I think it looks a little goofy. It doesn't even look whether it's uh, you know cheap looking or premium. I can't decide what this headphone looks like in terms of uh, uh, whether it whether it looks like a uh, a premium piece of equipment. But I can just say it just looks really weird on the head, right? And a lot of people aren't going to care about that, and they'll happily go out onto the street and wear this. I think this thing will get you a lot of uh, attention, and not necessarily in a good way because it does look kind of strange. Um, but leave a comment. I mean, maybe you like the look of this. You can have a look at it while it's on my head. I just think it has this weird kind of boxy shape. Um, I should actually talk about the Audio-Technica M50X just briefly as a note. Uh, these, these two headphones are actually interesting to compare because they're both somewhat warm sounding. Now, the thing is the M50X sounds a little less refined than the NAD. It just feels a little less uneven in terms of the overall kind of frequency response uh, that kind of thing, like it's a little more bumpy, whereas the NAD just feels smooth all the way from the bass up to the treble until it kind of drops off in the treble. But the one thing the M50X has over the NAD is that because it has more high frequency texture, it has a bit more of a of a sparkle to the high frequency, just a bit of more of a drier side uh, up top. It actually sounds a little bit more detailed than the NAD as a result. Um, and I'll and I'll come back to the M50X in a moment. I do want to talk about this headphone. But uh, yeah, no, no, this is a good headphone. I'm, I'm really quite enthusiastic about this. It is a very, um, very, very finely tuned headphone. And I think for a company that hasn't really made headphones before, this they've done a really exceptional job with the NAD. Uh, it is a pretty slick looking headphone. I'm sorry, a pretty slick sounding headphone. I don't think it's a slick looking headphone. Um, 
But yeah, I mean, it's also comfortable. It's a good headphone. Uh, I, if you're kind of waiting on my review to tell you whether or not to buy this, uh, I think this is a good value headphone. I think it uh, sounds excellent. Um, and uh, it's actually about $349 in Australia and about $300 in the US. I think that price is actually quite fair. I think this is the kind of price that I would expect to pay for a headphone of this caliber. So um, I will give you a preliminary endorsement of this headphone. Um, but yeah, it's been really good. So again, uh, live Q&A, so you can ask me any questions about the NAD if you have any of them. Um, but let's move on. Uh, next thing I wanted to talk about was the Sennheiser HD headphone line. And let me just get that unit up here. So this headphone that I have here at the moment, this is the uh, Sennheiser HD6 Mix. There's also, I received from Sennheiser, uh, Sennheiser Australia, a review unit of the HD7 and the HD8 DJ. Those are all loan units. Um, these are, I can tell you first and foremost, if you're going to ask, is this headphone for me, the answer is probably going to be no um, in most cases because this is a headphone that has design, been designed from the ground up for DJs and a lot of things point to this particular ID. One thing is that it only comes with coiled or three meter cables and none of them have smartphone remotes. So you can really forget about using this uh, as a portable uh, kind of headphone unless you want to have a massive chunk of cable just hanging out of your pocket. And the cable terminals are very chunky. Uh, this kind of thing will stick out of your pocket when you stick it into an iPhone and that kind of thing. It's really a bit too long as a, as a cable um, plug to be plugged into your iPhone or, or your smartphone and sticking out of your pocket. The other thing is that clamping force on this headphone is incredibly high. So uh, this is designed to stick on your head and it, it is an around ear fit. So it will go around your ears but clamping pressure is designed to be exceptionally hard just to isolate noise. Now noise isolation is fantastic on these headphones. Uh, you, you can, you know, it's, it's some of the strongest noise isolation, probably is the strongest noise isolation I've ever heard from an around ear headphone. Um, but the sound itself is something that's tuned again for DJ applications. Even the HD6 mix is quite similar to the HD7 and the HD8 DJ. Uh, it is a, a, a sound that's tuned to have the high frequencies rolled off somewhat. Um, so it, it's especially rolled off to a degree so that I, I believe it's been done so that you can turn up the volume on this very high and you won't necessarily get hearing damage because of some high frequency uh, sound effect in the track that you're mixing, which is, I believe, really important for DJs considering that they do have to turn up the volume on their headphones very high. So if you are looking for like a, a subtle kind of high fidelity sound out of this, and if, even if you are looking for it to sound like the Sennheiser HD25, I think you'd be disappointed. They do not sound at all similar. The HD25 has more of a mid, uh, uh, a mid forward kind of sound. It's more, uh, you know, it's more musical. You know, it's it's got the high frequency kind of. Uh, it, it's got the mid forwardness and then the bass and it's kind of fun and bouncy whereas this is much more of a smooth uh, up top, very very warm sounding, very very dark sounding headphone, uh, predominantly uh, a bassy sound. The bass is incredibly tight, it's very punchy but it is far and away a headphone that is seriously intended for some specific use cases. So I'm um, so I think I would recommend this as a listening headphone only if you were, you know, for some reason you were after a really, really durable headphone because the build quality on this and the HD8 in particular is mind-blowing and is some of the most um, nice build quality I've ever had experienced in a headphone. They are really chunky and solid feeling. If you wanted something with a very, very high noise isolation, very, very high durability, uh, and you don't mind the chunky cables and you want a bassy sound, uh, basically, you, you're going to use it like a DJ would, uh, then I would recommend the HD uh, DJ series. I wouldn't necessarily recommend it uh, just for EV, easy kind of listening alone um, unless you were, yeah, uh, after all those things that I just described. But uh, so far, my experience with this headphone has been quite positive. I think it is a really cool uh, headphone. So really pretty positive about this. 
Anyway, um, moving on to another question. So, uh, I don't know if someone else has answered you, Cheap, but uh, Cheap Skates United has asked, has he talked about the Chromebook yes, uh, uh, yet? Yes, I have talked about the Chromebook, but if you have any specific question, I'm very happy to answer it about it. I can come back and talk about it if you have any particular questions. Um, but yeah, okay. Moving on to the last thing that I wanted to talk about in this cast was the Audio Technica ATH M50X. Uh, and I should say thanks first of all to Audio Technica Australia. This is actually a uh, review unit that they have given to me to keep. Uh, this, uh, I should say, you know, if you didn't watch my unboxing video, the M50, the original version, was my first full-sized headphone. And uh, so it's kind of really exciting for me to see an update of this headphone. This is the M50X limited edition. So it comes in this blue and tan color. Now, I know a lot of people don't love this color scheme. I really actually like it. I think it looks really good, especially in person. But it is quite distinctive. Uh, it does have a particular look to it with this royal blue coloration and the copper uh, and the tan uh, headband and everything like that. Now what I can say about the M50X, I don't have the M50 on hand to directly compare to, so when I make my final review, I am going to try and uh, have those uh, tested side by side just to have a listen to it. Um, but the biggest change about the M50X is, has been obviously the removable cable, because now the cable can be removed and you get a portable cable as well as a 3 meter straight cable and a coiled cable in the box. And the really important thing about this is that now finally you can actually think of the M50X as a portable headphone. Because so often people will say the M50X is the only headphone you need to buy. Well, it really isn't because it's very hard to use portably. You get that massive, massive um, plug on the end of it, on the end of a very long cable. It's very heavy. It's just not convenient to use in a portable scenario. That problem has more or less been resolved. Uh, with the M50X. It still is a very large headphone. It still is um, a headphone that's not going to be as comfortable as some other headphones on the market in terms of clamping force and, and that kind of thing. It is designed to be a studio headphone, so it has been designed to kind of stick on your head, uh, stay on your head better. But I do think it is a comfortable headphone, first and foremost. It still is pretty comfortable. It sounds really good for the price. And I, I am really struck now, actually, considering that it can be used as a portable headphone, that this headphone is now closest to the one headphone that I would recommend for most people to consider if they wanted just a headphone that they could use at home, they could use it outside, um, and they wanted good sound quality at a reasonable price. Because this is uh, coming in at about 169 I think, uh, US dollars on Amazon. I saw that um, price really, really like the sound of this. It, it's not the most balanced sound, I have to say, even for a studio can. It can sound uh, a little bassy, um, more than just a little bassy. It sounds a little uneven sometimes in the frequency response. It has some particular emphasis on it, so it sounds warm, but also a little woolly. It has a little bit of uh, a kind of you know, a bit of fuzz to the sound in, in some, um, I think there's some bumps in the frequency response that give it kind of that uh, uh, sound to it. Uh, the sound stage can be a little compressed as a result. It doesn't sound like the most wide open of headphones. Uh, the treble, while it's very nice and textured and it works well with some female vocals, at other times it can sound just a bit tinny. This is a bit metallic. Um, but this is all kind of nitpicking because for a headphone of this price, uh, I think I would be very positive about recommending this uh, to most people. It is a, is a really uh, well-considered headphone. The M50 is one of the most popular headphones in the world, and it seems like they've made nothing but improvements with the M50X, so you know, I would be very, very happy to recommend this headphone, especially this limited edition. I don't know how many of these are being made, um, but these are a really, really uh, good buy, I reckon. And if you're a fan of the original M50 and you wanted something that was a bit more portable, I would be very happy with this. And now it comes in black and white and this limited edition, so that's really cool. Uh, okay, so that's all I kind of had planned as far as uh, notes go for this uh, stream. 
Um, if you have any more questions, I have about 10 minutes left. I'm going to try and keep this stream at about half an hour and subsequent shows to be about half an hour. Um, so if you have any questions now is a good time to ask. I will uh, respond to anything that you have in the Q and A. Oh, one more little kind of piece of news um, is that I have in fact found a very nice person who contacted me on Facebook pages, uh, on my Facebook page to let me know that he was happy to sell me his Sony XBA H3. Um, I do not uh, know if that unit will come to Australia, so in the end I did end up taking up this nice man on his offer, so it is being sent to me uh, by from Latvia, and I'm very excited to have a listen to it, despite the fact that I was not hugely enthusiastic about the sound of the H1. I'm still quite excited about the sound of the H3. I'm planning to do a big roundup of the Sony XBA40 and the Sony EX1000, the Sony 7550, the XBA H1, the XBA H3, the XBA1, all the entire lineup of Sony's kind of evolutionary history of in-ear earphones. And I've wanted to do that for some time. And once I have the H3, I'll be able to do that. Uh, and then once that's done, I'm going to be able to let go of some of those earphones because I don't really need to keep all of them around. But it will be nice to have a kind of pictorial history of the uh, Sony in-ear lineup. And the only one I don't have that would be nice to have in that lineup would be the EX700. Um, I have heard that. My friend used to have a pair of those. Actually, she still does have a pair of them, but they are kind of dying on her a little after many years of faithful use. Um, so, yeah. Anyway, um, throwing it out to you for the question and answers. Um, I do notice that you guys have been a bit quiet today, so I don't know. Um, maybe I've been talking too much and you haven't been able to formulate your questions. I don't have any other particular headphone news to report that I can come off of the straight, you know, off the top of my head. Hmm. How about this? I can talk about the... Ooh, no, I can't even. I, I don't know where that is. Okay, yep. Uh, I suppose I should talk about this if there's not going to be any questions. This is... So if you remember, I made that video about the Bose Sound True, and then I found out it didn't fit with my glasses. I did, in fact, swap it with the on-ear version, but I didn't make an unboxing video. Uh, so this is an on-ear version of the Bose Sound True, and it is... Well, first I should say, this is the most comfortable on-ear headphone that I have ever worn in my entire life. It is so comfortable because it is incredibly lightweight, and the ear cushions are incredibly soft. So that's the first thing. The second thing is that when I listen to this headphone, it makes me realize I understand now how Bose has gotten to where they are today, not because... Uh, not because they've made amazing sounding uh, gear, but they've made comfortable sounding headphones, right? This headphone is very, very comfortable sounding. And what I mean by that, it's not offensive. It's, it's got a bass line without being particularly bassy. The treble is rolled off. This is not a particularly detailed sounding headphone. It's not, certainly for the price I paid, it's about, uh, about 210 I think I paid for it, and I think the US price is about 180 I think it is overpriced based simply on sound quality alone. I would not recommend on, on sound quality alone this particular headphone um, just because the sound really lacks detail. And if you put it up against something like the Sennheiser Amperia, it really, really lacks a, a sense of finesse. It's just a bit loose in the bass. The overall sound is just a bit sleepy, that kind of thing. Um, so it's not the it's not the be-all and end-all in terms of detail. And certainly, I think it's overpriced. For, that, for sound quality one, but it is a well-engineered headphone. It is really super light and super comfortable. And if those were things that you were after in particular, I would not really have that many other headphones. I haven't tried that many good on-ear headphones um, that I would recommend to you. Uh, you know, it's, it's hard for me to say. I mean, technically in terms of sound, just because it's a more mellow sound, it's more signature that I enjoy. I enjoy this more than the Sennheiser Momentum on ear. I didn't really like the sound signature of that headphone, but I'm certain that the Momentum on ear was more detailed sounding than this headphone. The only complaint I have about the build of this headphone is that because it is so lightweight, uh, it actually doesn't feel so solid on the head. It doesn't actually feel 
if you moved your head around really fast, I don't feel like it would stay securely on the head. It would kind of, um, you know, I feel like even the weight of the cable is enough to make this headphone kind of feel a little unsteady. Um, that said, uh, and also noise isolation isn't fantastic on this headphone, but it is an interesting piece of engineering, and I have, you know, at least enjoyed listening to it. It has been an interesting listen. Uh, but, yeah, not, not the best value, but it is one of the most comfortable headphones I've ever tried. So if you're after that, I think that would be a good idea. Okay, so we got some questions now. Uh, let's answer a question by Jack. Uh, he just arrived. Hi, Jack. Good to see you again. What's the main topic? Well, we actually had a, a number of main topics. We had the Chromebook, the NAD Viso HP50, and the Sennheiser HD DJ. Now, this stream will be uploaded again uh, after this stream is complete. It just takes a couple of hours for YouTube to process, but it will be available for you guys to watch afterwards. And I did have quite a lot to talk about, so I'll put individual time codes up in the video so you can jump to specific parts of the video if you want to uh, hear those bits. But yeah, we went through a bunch of things: the the, the Chromebook, the Viso HP50, the HD DJ uh, Sennheiser line, and the Audio Technica M50X. And you can kind of watch that afterwards if you would like. Um, okay, so the next question is from Marcus. Are the Sennheiser HD 8 good for listening to music, uh, in particular progressive house? I am actually... House music is something that I'm not that familiar with. I have listened to a fair bit of house music, but I wouldn't know what entails progressive house. Uh, I think of the genres that the HD 8 will probably be best with are any genres that you would actually hear in a club. So. Um, because it has a very visceral, very tight bass, it's very uh, it's very good for those kind of genres. I think. I don't think it is the like certainly because it is an ex it is quite an expensive headphone. Uh, the entire lineup, especially the HT8 DJ. But if you were tossing up between the HT7 DJ and the HT8 DJ, I would say get the HT8 DJ. Even it costs about fifty bucks more. And you get, uh, let me just show you, uh, with the HD8 DJ, you get a metallic swiveling um, joint, actually. No, that is an empty headphone joint. Let me see if I can pull that up. Sorry, it's just somewhere next to me. One nice thing about the new place I'm in is that there are lots of little nooks and crannies for me to have lots of individual boxes. So I can pull things out pretty quickly. Um, the HD8 DJ has... Oh, and it has this particular smell from the box. I wish you could smell it too. It has this beautiful uh, gadget smell, uh, which is probably some sort of tech toxic, you know, uh, chemical, but whatever. Um, it has this metal ring, and far from being ornamental, this thing is probably going to be the thing that uh, experiences the most wear and tear on this headphone. And for the extra 50 bucks to have the insurance of this headphone not ever experiencing a breakage along this particular joint, I would pay the extra to get the HD8 DJ. Uh, and it is just a beautiful headphone in the hand. Again, the build quality is really excellent. I, as I said, in terms of price, I don't think this is going to be a best value option for, for as far as bang for buck goes in terms of sound quality. A lot of the extra money in this headphone has gone towards extra build quality um, and you know particular features that DJs in particular would enjoy. So unless you are a DJ, I wouldn't necessarily think that this is your best option. But it is one of the nicest, uh, most finely crafted, bassy sounding headphones that I have tried. And I still haven't tried the Remoto M100, if any of you are wondering. Uh, I'm working on that as soon as I finish off this current backlog of reviews. Anyway. Next question. Uh, sorry, just joined is an open, and this is from FTA, us, uh, FTA Alliance. Sorry, just joined is an open back headphone sound quality worth the lack of noise isolation? Well, it depends on where you're going to use it, essentially. Like, if you're going to use it in a noisy environment, if you live right next to a construction site or something and you're constantly being interrupted, then no, I wouldn't get an open back headphone because it's not. Number one, it doesn't have noise isolation, and number two, it's not going to be particularly, um, yeah, like, 
The, the advantages of, of an open back headphone technically are that because it's open back, the rear wave uh, of the driver won't be reflected in the ear cup back into the ear, so you do get a cleaner sound technically. Um, that said, a lot of open back headphones lack a bass as a result because they aren't able to exert sufficient, unless they're well designed, like some really nice open back headphone, but they aren't able to apply enough sufficient uh, damping kind of force on the driver to arrest its movement after the initial impulse. So with an open back headphone, you don't tend to get as tight bass, you don't get as strong a bass response, you get more distortion in the bass region. Um, with open back headphones, I think the, the, the one biggest advantage for me with open back headphones like the MA900 is that they're just more comfortable. You, you get more of a breathable fit. Um, they're much more comfortable to wear on the ear. So that's what I like most about open back headphones. Uh, if you were going to use it in a noisy environment, I would not suggest you get an open back headphone. So, you know, I, I suppose that's pretty obvious, but uh, if that helps your uh, question, then I, hopefully that does. Um, sure, SE215 or the FXD80 for rock, go with the FXD80. The SE215 is not, um, it's a bit sleepy, and I don't necessarily suggest it for rock because it, it, it will lack that kind of uh, fun dynamic sound that the FXD80 has. Uh, the SE215, I actually don't think, is the best sounding headphone in its price range. It just happens to be a good sounding headphone that has a detachable cable and very strong noise isolation and negative profile fit, and it's hard to find that for $99. So that's why I recommend the SE215. Um, but the FXD80, I think, has a more textured sound. It's more exciting to listen to. It's not the most natural sound, but you know, be very happy to uh, go with the FXD80. You probably will save a little money that way. OK, so Machinator asks, do you think tube amps are worth the price or hassle, or are there other alternatives to give your audio a better sound stage? OK, so this is a bit of controversy. I, I don't have a tube amp myself. I never really owned one. The thing is, with badly designed cheap tube amps, if you get a cheap tube amp, they will perform worse in terms of distortion characteristics over solid state amps. Uh, they will tend to have more harmonic distortion, and that, because it's second order harmonic distortion, uh, that kind of harmonic distortion tends to be a sound that some people like. It gives everything that kind of warm analog kind of sound. They they do kind of like it, but if you're looking for a uh, an amplifier that doesn't add anything to the signal. I mean, that's what people want generally. They want a neutral kind of sound. Uh, and my philosophy is always go with the neutral amplifier. And if you want to change sounds, go with different headphones. Don't go around collecting amplifiers because they cost a lot of money. And I honestly don't think they're worth uh, swapping around with. But you know, I do know that apparently the really high-end tube amplifiers are really, really good, and they perform really, really well, and they do really well in terms of measurements. But you know, I still think for the money you're paying, you're better off getting a solid state app. You can get some amazing solid state app. And I do, and I did just recently receive a review unit of the uh, JDS uh, O2 Special Edition. So just look out because I will have an unboxing of that up very soon. Um, I, I tend to think solid state apps are better. If you want better soundstage, just get a headphone with more soundstage. It's that's got to be my philosophy. Um, you can you can tweak around with amps as much as you want, but in the end, a lot of the differences aren't even going to be things that you can really tell. My, I always think it's safer just to stick with one app, which is what I've done, been doing for a long time, and, and just play with your headphones. It's more rewarding that way anyway. Headphones sound more different. You, you end up getting more out of it. Um, OK, so uh, there's just two more questions. I'll just take these last two questions, and I'll end this stream. Uh, from Jack, do you think Bayer Dynamics should renew their DT880? Seems like a classic, but it might also be using old technology. Well, if it ain't broke, don't fix it, you know, in, in a way. Um, the T90 is technically, by all accounts, meant to be the better, uh, more amazing technologically version of the uh, DT880, because technically the T90 has the uh, stronger magnetic force on the driver. It has, I think, like the Tesla driver, so it has a better you know, uh, uh, yeah, is able to better control the driver instead of, um, in terms of force exertion. Everything I've read about the T90, and I was really interested in the T90 for a long time because I did really like the DT880. 
and I was wondering if Hello would like the T90. But by all accounts, the treble spike on the T90 is more severe than the one on the DT880. And that really puts me off because I already found the treble spike on the DT880 could be a little, sorry, um, it could be a little off-putting at times, so I wasn't able to enjoy all my music with it. Um, the T90 is the technological upgrade over the DT880. Uh, apart from that, I don't really see how they could improve the DT880 that much without kind of cannibalizing their sales of the T90. Um, but I don't know, they could do what AKG does and just put out endless revisions of the same headphone over and over again and, and just sell them as new products, which always makes everyone very happy. Uh, the alternative is to do what Sennheiser does, which is what Sennheiser basically just does revisions uh, and they don't tell anyone. So they just subsequent hardware runs have revisions in the sound. There are debates about whether or not which way has uh, merit or not. I think. I would rather a company be more transparent about the changes that they're making with the headphone, um, but at the same time, I wouldn't, wouldn't want them to be like AKG putting out a new headphone every year. So, you know, I don't necessarily think you should fix what isn't broke. I don't think that's, uh, I don't think the DT880 is showing age in any particular way, um, but you may have a different opinion. I don't know. I think the DT880 is fantastic. So, anyway, last question. Uh, and this is from Intel Gigabyte, is ever tried Stax headphones? And the answer is no. Unfortunately, I haven't. I have tried some electrostatics. I did try the Sennheiser uh, H90, is it? The really, really amazing one. And I really should know the name because I'm meant to be like a headphone enthusiast. But I don't remember the special, very, um, the Orpheus, maybe. Uh, if it's meant to be the very, very special Sennheiser, I have listened to it. I did think it was pretty amazing, though I didn't get to hear music that I owned myself, so I can't comment um, directly on the sound. Um, I would like to try a Stax headphone one day, but the whole buying the Stax and then the amplifier and then all that kind of thing, it just puts me off just because it's so expensive and it seems so limited and so uncomfortable. Um, so, you know, for me... Uh, I tend to veer on the side of practicality. I think that's kind of obvious uh, if you've watched enough of my videos that I tend to focus not only on the sound aspects of the headphone, but also the ergonomic aspects. Um, so I tend to avoid anything that's just a bit too exotic unless it's a kind of situation where I just randomly listen to it. Yeah. Anyway, um, Jack just pops in with one last question. I'll answer this one last question, and this is the last question I'm going to answer. Is Jack is asking, oh, last question, how's the weather in Australia? It's pretty good. It's a bit cold, sunny. Um, it's pretty sunny for winter, so, um, and during the midday, I get a lot of glare into this room, so I tend to have a little bit of a window of opportunity where I can either film videos in the very morning or in the evening, like now. Right now, it is uh, 5, oh, sorry, uh, 3.52. Um, but yeah, no, I'm pretty happy with the weather. I, wouldn't mind it if it was a bit warmer, but not too bad. Anyway, uh, and yes, Marcus, I am streaming from my Surface Pro and answer your question. Anyway, thanks for joining me uh, for this first episode of uh, ThingCast. I want to make this a kind of semi-regular kind of stream where I'll just go through some of the stuff I've been looking through, um, a less formal way of kind of looking at various things that I'm looking at without going through the review structure. Let me know what you think in the comments. This video will go up afterwards, although you won't be able to obviously join in the live Q&A if you're watching this afterwards. Um, apart from that, thank you for everyone who joined in on this live stream, and thanks to all my regular subscribers. Again, you can always talk to me on Facebook uh, at facebook.com slash Lachlan Likes a Thing. Uh, I do have a cool quest to make because I finally... If you're going to ask me for advice on Facebook, on my Facebook page, please post the question on the public thread on the on the wall and not as a private message because I do prefer to answer these in public just because other people can see the answer and they can contribute their own opinion, which is always more helpful than just one guy telling you what to do. Um, so, yeah, I would prefer it if you would answer the ask the questions in the public page on the public post Sorry, on the public war. And as always, you can talk to me on Twitter, at LockLikesAThing. Uh, anyway, uh, enjoy the rest of your day.